welcome to the 8th justice vr krishnayar memorial lecture on the topic the future of work reimagining public services and employment in india organized under the auspices of sharada krishna sadgamaya foundation for law and justice let's begin the ceremony by lighting the lamp i humbly request the dignitaries on the dais to do the honors I invite advocate Fatima for the prayer song. E vishwa hridaya vipanji kamiti vaanarulum ജഗദീശ നമസ്തേ സർവചരാചര ചിന്മയരൂപ കൃപാവരം ചൊരിയൂ ഞങ്ങളിൽ കൃപാവരം ചൊരിയൂ ലോകാ സമസ്ത സുഖീനോ ഭവന്തു ഈ മന്ത്രമി invite justice k balakrishnan nayar president sharada krishna sadgamaya foundation for the welcome address good morning to all of you we are assembled here on the occasion of the 8th Justice V. R. Krishnayar Memorial Law Lecture. For the last two years we have held it in virtual mode. This time we are fortunate to have it in hybrid mode. My duty is to welcome all of you. Before that I deem it my duty to say a few words on Justice Krishnayar. Justice V. R. Krishnayar needs no introduction. as he was a humanist who began his political journey as a fellow traveler with communist movement and who tirelessly and continuously responded to circumstances situations by assuming different roles be it as a legislator minister judge of both high court and supreme court law commission member author of more than 100 books poet social activist etc this is a year not only excelled in each of the chosen fields but also stood with the civil society civil society whole heartedly and passionately he was the recipient of innumerable awards not only from india but also from various countries of the world and was widely acknowledged as a living legend of law during his lifetime Fali S. Nariman has described Jesse Sayer as a great stellar pointer in the judicial firmament and has further observed in his autobiography called 
before memory fails i quote he was responsible for an intent inspired a new thrust a new direction for the supreme court he helped to humanize the legal system particularly in the field of criminal jurisprudence and jail reform he believed firmly that a judge must have a social philosophy and a humane approach to legal problems and court he was fearless an abiding quality of a great judge that made him pass only a conditional order of stay strictly following earlier precedents in the famous election case of mrs indira gandhi which prompted sri hm sirwai india's constitutional critic to observe i quote the supreme court moved towards its finest hour a day before the proclamation of emergency on june 24th 1975 on which day justice krishna yer passed his order of conditional stay and court now i turn to my duty of welcoming the participants of this function this year we have the we have honorable mr justice suryakant jet supreme court of india for delivering the eighth justice v r krishna yer memorial law lecture on the subject reimagining of public services and employment in india mr justice suryakant before he was elevated to supreme court was the former chief justice of the himachal pradesh high court he was also a former judge of the punjab and haryana high court mr justice suryakant is set to become the 52nd chief justice of india His lordship started his practice at Hisar District Court of Haryana in 1984 and later shifted to Punjab and Haryana High Court Chandigarh in 1985. He represented multiple universities, boards, corporations, banks and various other government bodies in the High Court. He was appointed the youngest advocate general of Haryana on 7 July 2000 and was designated as senior advocate in March 2001 Jesse Suryagan held the office of advocate general till his elevation as a permanent judge of the Punjab and Haryana High Court on 9th January 2004 He was also nominated as member of the National Legal Services Authority on 23 February to February 2007 for two consecutive terms Jesse Suryagan organized and attended several prestigious conferences On 5th October 2018 he took oath as the chief justice of the Himachal Pradesh High Court In May 2019 the Supreme Court Collegium headed by CJI Ranjan Gogoi recommended his elevation to Supreme Court of India On 24th May 2019 his lordship took oath as the judge of the Supreme Court of India He is a judge of great eminence and we are proud to have him with us to deliver today's lecture owing to unforeseen circumstances he is able to present only virtually in this meeting i cordially welcome his lordship to this bogus function on behalf of the sharda krishna satgamaya foundation for law and justice and on behalf of all the persons present here we have with us Honorable Mr. Justice S. Mani Kumar, the Chief Justice of the High Court of Kerala, who on our request readily agreed to preside over this function. I am saying a few words of introduction on him for the benefit of those present here who do not belong to the legal fraternity. His lord was born on 24th April 1961, graduated in chemistry with first class from the Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda College, Chennai. He obtained B.L. degree from Dr. Ambedkar Government Law College, Chennai in 1983 and enrolled with the Bar Council of Tamil Nadu on 23-11-1983. His lordship started practice in the Madras High Court and the Central Administrative Tribunal in Service Matters. He practiced under the guidance of his father, Sri K. Swami Durai, 
who later adorned the bench of Madras High Court. He was a counsel for the government of Tamil Nadu in the state administrative tribunal and on the civil side in the Madras High Court. As additional government leader, he represented the departments of education, prohibition, excise, cinema and cooperative societies, government of Tamil Nadu. He represented the selection committee for medical admissions in Tamil Nadu. He was counsel for the Tamil University, Tanjur, Tamil Nadu Veterinary and Animal Sciences University, Chennai. He was the panel counsel for the International Airport Authority of India, BSNL, Indian Oil Corporation Limited, Dindigal Central Cooperative Bank, and Tamil Nadu Adi Dravidar Housing and Development Corporation. He had the opportunity to serve as a senior central government standing counsel for the government of India, which was of late redesignated as Assistant Solicitor General of India. He represented the Registry of Madras High Court in service matters. His lordship was sworn in as additional judge of the Madras High Court on 31st of July 2006 and as permanent judge on 9th November 2009. After serving more than 13 years as judge of the Madras High Court, he was appointed as Chief Justice of the Kerala High Court. His lordship was sworn in as Chief Justice of this court on 11th October 2019. Ever since, he is serving this institution with great distinction. I cordially welcome His Lordship to this function on behalf of Sharda Krishna Satgamaya Foundation for Law and Justice and also on behalf of all of you. I welcome the sitting and former judges of this court and also the lawyers, both seniors and juniors present here. I notice with pleasure the presence of Justice T.V. Ramakrishnan, Justice Chali, Justice Vinu Abraham, Senior Counsel Siddharthan Sahasranaman, and many others. See, I don't I recognize the face of many, but I could not <laughs> recollect the names. I plead guilty. My age is the real guilty person. I also welcome the ramp holders in LLM and LLB courses of various universities in Kerala who are present here to receive the awards given in the name of Justice Krishnayar. I also welcome their family members who are present here to witness the receiving of awards by them. I also welcome the journalists present here to report on this function. I welcome the members of the staff of this court and the members of the public present here. I welcome all of you once again. Thank you all. I invite our Chief Justice, Honorable Mr. Justice Mani Kumar, to deliver the presidential address. <clears throat> Honorable Justice Surya Kant, Judge, Supreme Court of India, Justice K. Balakshan Nair, former Judge, High Court of Kerala, and President of this Foundation. Justice T. V. Ramakrishnan, my esteemed and uh, brother and sister judges, Advocate Mr. Sagasaranam, Advocate Mr. Sanat Ramakrishnan, Secretary and other office bearers of this foundation, learned judicial officers, my respected senior advocates, meritorious students and parents present here, Good morning to all. I am thankful to Sarada Krishna Sadmaya Foundation for Law and Justice for organizing this commemorative program as a tribute to a great judge, 
of this country, Justice V. R. Krishnaya, in the presence of a scholarly judge, Honorable Justice Surekant, Judge Supreme Court of India. As we all know, Justice Krishnaya made indelible imprints in the society as a dynamic lawyer, a towering humanitarian, a vibrant legislator, a stalwart jurist, an able administrator, and a committed social worker. Justice Krishna had the rare distinction of uh, holding the constitutional assignments of a minister of a state, judge of high court, and thereafter judge of the Supreme Court of India. As Mahatma Gandhi said, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Throughout his life, Justice Krishna was a person who had tried to be such man. I would like to quote the words of Justice Krishna Haya from his reply speech made at the time of his swearing in ceremony as judge of the Kerala High Court. I quote, Speaking for myself, life becomes meaningful and finds fulfillment, whatever be the department of activity, if the larger cause of humanity is served, if the tries to destiny that our nation made long years ago is redeemed, and I had some patriotic role, some small contribution to make in their behalf, be it as an administrator, promoter of public cause, advocate or judge. We cannot forget the forefathers of philosophy of legal aid, Justice Krishnaya and Justice P. N. Bhagavadi, who in 1980s paved the way for public interest litigation movement in India by giving a wide meaning to the words locus standi, where people of India have a chance to access to justice. Justice Krishnaya played a very significant role in molding the era of judicial system to protect rights, liberty and justice to people and in particular to the poor, weaker, and the weaker sections, marginalized sections of the society. Through his judgments, he preserved the concept of social justice as an important jurisprudential thought, maintained human right in all his judgments. Justice O. China Paradi, in his book, The Court and the Constitution of India, as observed thus, I quote, Great judges, of course, there were many. Of all the judges who were on the benches of the Supreme Court, Justice Krishna was undoubtedly the most creative with a bleeding heart for the underprivileged, for the workers and the exploited, and for everyone who needed kindness and generosity. Now, coming to the topic, Enhancement and literacy, attainment of higher education, skills and occasional education have led to rapid increase in the number of persons seeking jobs commensurate with their educational qualification and skill. The globally, Indian economy is marching to fifth place we cannot ignore the fact that we are facing fundamental challenges to ensure that this growth translates into creation of more and better jobs for the people. Preference towards government jobs have increased tremendously owing to job security, assured salary, and prestige as associated with it. All these factors have a significant bearing on the labor market, labor force, workforce, unemployment, 
nature of employment and distribution of workers over various activities. And therefore, there should be necessary and appropriate policy response for employment generation. Rapid technological advancements are taking place day by day. No doubt, this will create more job opportunities in that sphere, even though they affect the traditional jobs. Therefore, the unemployed youth of a country have to be equipped with ICT initiatives and other technical modes. Lofty ideals and constitutional goals which Justice Krishna had all along aimed, provocated throughout his lives, should be achieved. And uh, in my humble view, closure of industries and factories will reduce employment opportunities. A country can progress if only labor of the nation is made integral to the development process. Production and distribution, if to be regulated by the government, there should be space and atmosphere for others for creating job opportunities. An humble view, government should give priority not only to create jobs in public services, but also to enable the youth to enjoy the fruits of the latest technology like artificial intelligence, internet of things, information and communication technology, etc. And at this juncture, I'm also the humble view that taking note of the majority of the population of the country, there should be integration of technology with agriculture. The alarming rate of unemployment clearly also points out that is also my humble view that we are in dire need of industries and factories in every state, which can be a great source of employment. Right to employment is not a fundamental right, but right to live with dignity is a constitutional right. In my humble opinion, the vision of Justice Krishnaya, equality and justice can be achieved if only there are sufficient opportunities for employment. So Justice Krishna has left us the noble values and ideals you always stood for will continue to be our guiding factor, guiding principles in the administration of justice as well as in making justice accessible to the citizens of our country. Let's all move forward on the path of reforms valued by great Honorable Justice Krishnaya. I'm extremely happy that today, Honorable Justice Surya Kant, Judge Supreme Court of India, has joined us to deliver the eighth Justice V. R. Krishnayar Memorial Lecture on the subject, The Future of Work, Reimagining Public Services and Employment in India. Before concluding, I once again express my sincere thanks and gratitude to the office bearers of this foundation for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lordship. Thank you for those kind words. Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Kant, Judge, Supreme Court of India. His Lordship's tenure as a Judge of the Punjab and Haryana High Court, Chief Justice of Himajal Pradesh High Court, and presently as a Judge of the Honorable Supreme Court, witnessed the reign of a great Judge who treats lawyers fairly, disagree fearlessly, and decide with clarity. An epitome of professional and personal integrity, his lordship's erudition and empathy is widely acclaimed. Though we are deprived of the privilege of his gracious presence in person with us today, owing to personal inconvenience, we are indeed delighted to have with us the virtual presence of Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Khan, who will deliver the 8th Justice V. R. Krishnayar Memorial Lecture on the topic, Future of Work, Reimagining Public Services and Employment in India. A very good morning to one and all present here. Justice 
Ashwini Kumar, Honorable the Chief Justice Kerala High Court, my brother and sister judges of the Kerala High Court, Justice K. Balakrishnan Nair, and Justice T. V. Ramakrishnan, former judges of Kerala High Court, and office bearers of Sharda Krishna Sadgamya Foundation of Law, the trustees of the trust, senior advocates, members of the bar, Sri Sanad Ramakrishnan and advocate, distinguished faculty and guests, my dear students, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me immense pleasure to deliver the 8th Justice V. R. Krishna Iyer Memorial Lecture. It's my proud privilege to say that within a period of less than 6 months, this is second occasion that I am speaking in the memory of Justice V. R. Krishna Iyer. Three months back, I spoke in National Law University at Shimla on a subject which was very close to the heart of Justice Krishna Iyer and that pertained to the jail reforms and rights of prisoners, particularly under trials. Today, the subject matter is the future of work in India, reimagining public services and employment. I must commend the Foundation for organizing this lecture series in the memory of Justice V. R. Krishna Iyer. Since its inception, the lectures have served as an informal treasure trove for legal fraternity and students and a platform for civil society to discuss and introspect on issues which hold immense public importance. The theme of today's discourse, namely the future of work, is another hotly debated subject that has become part of our everyday conversation, especially after the pandemic, which has ushered us to the age of digitization from where and which even our judicial system couldn't remain unscathed. From an international viewpoint, the subject attains even more importance for our nation because of the favorable demographic dividend. While the world would be rapidly aging, India would still be young. In the upcoming three or four decades, we would be a talent powerhouse and the largest contributor to the global workforce. Couple this with a world advancing with rapid proliferation of digital technologies, there is absolutely no denying the exciting opportunity our nation holds for being at the forefront of a new economic revolution. At the same time, this also necessitates greater caution because of the crucial impact it would have on our society, especially in the sphere of labor relations. To rephrase the famous adage, with great power comes great responsibility, let us say it like this, with great opportunity should come great scrutiny. I must emphasize that today's lecture would transcend the boundaries of law and venture into the arena of policy. Some of the issues I wish to address in the upcoming parts may also require an interdisciplinary approach to reach workable solutions. Hence, it is only apt that this subject is being discussed in the memory of one of the nation's finest legal luminary who donned multiple hats, ranging from being a passionate social activist, an active politician, a high court judge, a member of the law commission, and then a Supreme Court judge, also a poet, as well as an engaging author of more than 100 books. However, underlining his philosophy across all these phases of life was that of a humanitarian grounded on the principle of dignity. That's why people call him the man of masses. In the first edition of this lecture series, delivered by senior advocate Fali Nariman, which Justice Balakrishnan was also referring to, he referred to Justice Krishnaya as a People's Chief Justice of India and credited Justice Krishnaya of leaving behind a legacy 
comparable only with Lord Denning in the context of our English counterparts. On a personal level, I envisage him as a jurist of international repute who brought a sea change of reforms in almost all areas of law, especially the constitutional interpretation and transformed it into the transformative and living document that it is today. At his swearing in ceremony, Justice Krishnaya made his intentions clear by stating that he shall endeavor in a humble measure to be a judicial activist and treat his career ahead as a fresh call to service in the cause of the rule of law, which not only merely keeps the executive on the leash, but insists upon the fundamental and equal rights of every individual to a really free and good life. <coughs> During his tenure as a judge, Justice Krishnaya made sure that he lived true to his words. Regarding today's theme, Justice Krishnaya delivered landmark decisions in Bangalore Water Supply and Sewerage Board case, in Rambagh Palace Hotel Jaipur case, and in N. Sundra Mani case, all of them leaving an indelible impact on labor jurisprudence in India and relentlessly upholding the constitutional ideals of social justice. In his own words, he saw workers as, and I quote, the actual builders of Bharat. In the case of Gujarat Steel Tubes, Justice Krishnaya ruled that Articles 39, 41, 42, 43 and 43A speak of the right to an adequate means of livelihood, the right to work, humane conditions of work, living ways ensuring a decent standard of life and enjoyment of leisure and participation of workers in management of industries and that without these mandates the law will fail functionally. He called this the value vision of Indian industrial jurisprudence. In LIC versus DJ Bahadur case, Justice Ayer reiterated the constitutional bias towards social justice to the weaker sections including the working class in the directive principles of state policy and stated that it's a factor which must enliven judicial consciousness while decoding the meaning of legislation. While times have changed and new issues regarding work have emerged, the ideals of labor jurisprudence <coughs> propagated by Justice Krishna here continue to remain relevant. Friends, the, in the context of today's lecture, the first issue arises that what is the future of work? And I have tried to explain it saying the rise of modern technology has already started to impact our nation and it is becoming increasingly technology driven with an impact on both content and context. The changing nature of work have significant contrast if we compare the work and life of a farmer with a middle sized land holding today with the one merely a generation ago. Even in the same generation, the variable impact of technology on different professions is immense. For today's lecture, I am going to adapt the methodology of a leading global consult consulting firm, Deloitte, which has broadly categorized the impact based on three W's, namely, first, the work, which refers to tasks or jobs that can be automated due to change in business models. Second B, the workforce, which refers to alternative workforce models and utilization of available talent such as the gig economy. And C, the workplace, which refers to where the work is done. Before advancing further, I must clarify that this classification is not an attempt at strict compartmentalization of the impact areas. In fact, you would find that some of the issues which I would be discussing later quite freely transgress into these three classifications. <clears throat> now, explaining the concept of work, let me say that while disruptions are inevitable, it is uncertain as to what extent automation and technology will impact employment, job roles and skilling requirements. What is certain, however, is the need to create new and relevant employment opportunities for India's growing youth population and women, as studies are increasingly suggesting that the advent of advanced technology 
have the potential to displace labor <clears throat> the world is currently experience, experiencing rapid and widespread advance meant in automation based heavily on artificial intelligence and robotics and the use of big data and machine learning examples of recent innovations including driverless cars service robots caring for the elderly smart factories internet of things and 3d printing machines driven by computer power robotics and artificial intelligence are now increasingly able to perform tasks previously restricted to humans while technological innovation in previous eras also consumed old older jobs and created new ones it was always coupled with reducing misery and drudgery on and off the job generating economic growth and prosperity <coughs> so a question which is rightly asked by many is what's not to like about technology going forward the answer lies in two prongs as professor cynthia sland of the new york university explains firstly the economy gains that labor replacing technologies has helped to generate are highly skewed in favor of top income bracket which is increasing income disparity between the classes and secondly technologies are fastly replacing human skills which has led to a situation where job destruction is outpacing job creation leading to unemployment and resultantly reduced levels of social security for citizens studies which take a more alarming view of the situation such as those conducted by the world bank assess the number of jobs at the risk of automation as high as 50% and above and even in conservative approach does not count it less than 10% though it must be noted that these studies were not conducted in the context of the indian labor market and the fact the disparity between these figures might seem a lot the impact even in a best case scenario of 10% would be phenomenal because the unemployment rate hovers around 7 to 8% for our nation a sudden spurt in unemployment which doubles the number of unemployed people would certainly be a matter of serious concern what is thus inescapable is the perceived adverse impact of technological innovation the logic of economics makes it imperative for anyone running a business to switch from manual labor to automation as soon as the cost of using the latter is lesser than the former this conversation takes even more of a difficult turn for labor economists who support the conventional indicators such as wages or working conditions this is so because in a setting where automated machines are becoming increasingly cheaper as compared to conventional manual labor bargaining for higher wages or associated benefits only upscales the cost of labor and further incentives wises the use of machines to this end we all know the dilemma faced by policy makers to tackle this inevitable march of technology in our daily life however there are exciting approaches that we as a legal fraternity should take note let's first deal with the issue of job availability unlike earlier occasions the rate of job discretion the uh, job discretion uh, destruction is certainly higher than creation and upskilling the one left behind even in the vast ocean of unemployed people we find that there is much surplus of the workforce as there is also a shortage as an immediate measure changing the parameters of education and skill is of utmost importance this please uh, try to appreciate i am trying to explain that in my view as an immediate measure changing the parameters of education and skill is of utmost importance this entails the need to ensure that education and skilling are in line with industry's skill sets thankfully governments across the board today are conscious of this and are working in tandem with private sector players to upgrade 
and fulfill the need for new skill sets. A prime example of this, all of we have seen, is the National Skill Development Mission, which has been in function since 2015. However, now that we have established the importance of skill development in upcoming future, it is imperative to ask ourselves the question. And the question is: Should there be a right to skill training? Our young population is a strong human resource only if they are educated, skilled. and find productive employment countries such as germany and south korea have already introduced right based legislations for skill training closer home the state of chatisgarh has, uh, has introduced the chatisgarh right of youth to skill development act 2013 which recognizes the right to opportunities for skill development for its residents the rapid change in the demand for skilled workforce which cannot be fulfilled through conventional education methods necessitates that skill development be backed with a pan india legislation that entitles millions of youth entering the workforce a right to be skilled and treatment on par with the right to education equally important is to discourage mass and sudden adoption of automated machinery through appropriate tax policies measures suggested may for example include taxation on robotics with a holistic understanding of all possible consequences it is thus appropriate to employ a tax policy which reduces tax on the use of human labor the goal must be to permit a modicum of redistribution from wealthier taxpayers towards ordinary workers nevertheless i must express it straight that such tax measures or any similar measures are only feasible in the short run because they can disincentivize mass and sudden adoption of technology only for a limited period because in the longer run advancements in technology would decrease the cost component of new technology finally there must be a shift away from employment as the foundation for allocating basic social entitlements such as ensuring minimum standards of living in the upcoming era where people might no longer be secured within stable employment relationships both state and private players are expected to extend their sphere of responsibilities stakeholders claim that measures such as that of universal lump sum payment in the form of a guaranteed basic income need to be experimented with across the globe then i'll try to explain what is workforce friends informality is a well known characteristic of the indian labor market with 92% of employment being informal if recent trends are something to go by this casual nature of employment is set to grow and even in the organized sectors also the share of informal employment is on the rise as contractualization is the growing norm in the service sector the phenomenal rise of gig economy is alarming it is generally described as the exchange of labor for money between individuals or companies via digital platforms that actively facilitate matching between providers and customers on a short term and payment by task basis thanks to the rapid adoption of new technology as noted above the ever increasing rate of urbanization and the demographic divide this gig workforce is estimated to expand to 2.35 crore workers by the year 2029-30 as per the recent niti aayog estimates in light of the covid-19 experience it is not even necessary to explain the importance of these workers especially the ones who work whose work was based on online software apps or digital platforms known commonly as platform based workers as all of you remember the heroic tales of delivery personnel aiding in delivery of food groceries medicines and even oxygen cylinders during the pandemic uh, are sufficient evidence of their vital role in the present day the emergence of this economy alters the traditional employer employee relationship by categorizing 
gig workers as self employed or as business partners thus changing a core feature of labor laws and regulations this change brings a ton of issues for the gig workers since the alteration of the employer employee relationship lies within a gray area of labor law and policy gig workers such as delivery personnel are facing issues of job insecurity low pay lack of support from the organizations they work with unfair labor practice and so many other things in the case of india keeping in view the constitutional ideals of social justice it was time for us to draft legislations and policies to uphold the dignity and rights of big workers and counter the socio economic challenges faced by them admirably the present government was clear in recognizing that the existing legal frame work was outdated and fragmented it has introduced the new labor codes which attempts to cover the gig economy on two aspects one wages and second social security nevertheless like all new legislations these two have been subjected to criticism and may require fine tuning in near future in any case since a lot of associated issues in respect of these codes are subjudice before courts it's not appropriate for me to comment on the same and therefore i stop here as far as this aspect is concerned additionally it is also right time for us to approach this issue on a comparative basis with other jurisdictions after all the gig economy explosion is not limited to india alone we can also take inspiration from international jurisdictions such as the european union which has proposed a directive for improving working conditions in platform work the proposed directive deals with employment status misclassification algorithmic management and enhanced transparency the proposed directive pre- presumes employment with a platform exercises control over work such as our uniform and direct sharing of information with the workers affecting their working conditions it also seeks to protect adverse treatments and arbitrary dismissals thus providing essential labor protection to platform workers another example could be the state of california which also made amendments to its labor code creating a presumption that an individual is an employee unless the specified qualifications of an independent contractor are met with these developments more or less are based on law the broader policy policy framework also needs to be revisited recognition must be according to the increased freedom in the job markets and the varied nature of platform based work to design equitable schemes which ensure that benefits are readily available to workers the workers need to be made aware of their rights in the absence of a traditional union and state led support is necessary to ensure that these workers subscribe to welfare or social security schemes on the other hand new financial mechanisms must be envisaged to allow greater coverage of welfare schemes and the same must also take into account the specific interest of the platforms which are the core factor in job creation for the gig economy now then i have tried to explain the workplace the final aspect of future of work is the workplace traditionally work was envisaged as completely different from the domestic arena of family and leisure for long the balance among these spheres of work and home was one thing which workers and their organizations have stood for years together however the onset of the covid-19 pandemic forced a transition of the workplace to a work from home model wherein workplaces shifted from physical office spaces to virtual work spaces based in one's home which found favor with large part of the workforce on the one hand the workers enjoy the flexibility from work from home and the reduced number of hours deployed in commuting on the other hand firms worldwide indicate the benefits of work from home for employers which include increased profitability and higher productivity but as the saying goes there is no free lunch 
the associated benefits of work from home comes with a cost. What is that cost I have tried to explain? As noted by the renowned political scientist Gopal Guru and I quote him, home ceases to be an intimate space that is defined in terms of accommodating emotional relationships. Work from home may turn the public sphere into private and vice versa." Unquote. The sudden lockdowns permitted the intrusion of work in our bedrooms and we have witnessed conflicts emerging, rapturing the fragile ecosystem of an already precarious work-life balance. The intrusion of the workplace into the household allows the entry of exploitative work conditions to have a direct everyday bearing on the household and its privacy. This removes the possibilities of regulatory oversight over workplaces such as when office hours would extend beyond the stipulated time. Further, employer's liability could also be diminished due to legal loopholes. For example, what constitutes an accident at the workplace if the workplace is at home? Furthermore, Intrusion of private spheres is another aspect that has not been debated even though experiences indicate that remote work sees employers increasing surveillance of work and known work time. Such activities by employers, if allowed unchecked, could possibly overshadow efforts towards collective action which is the bedrock of the current labor law philosophy. Another dimension which remains neglected is the impact on marginalized sections of the workforce. Let's take the example of women who are now forced to do housework including but not limited to cooking, child care and professional work at the same place. This may be beneficial for some but others who lack enough support from family will be burdened in such environments. Additionally, persons who face violence or abuse at home will never be comfortable in a work from home environment as they now lack the emancipation of living home every day. It is indeed a live reality when we say that for some of us home represents limits of freedom and a regimented disciplinary regime. A permanent shift to the work from home model represents a reversal to old social biases which can negatively affect women's empowerment. Yet another marginalized section which gets adversely impacted from the change in the workplace are the economically weaker sections who are also often intrinsically correlated to their caste or geographical status. The work from home model assumes the universal availability of dwelling space with the requirement and requisite amenities. But the same are, is not true, especially in our conditions. This could lead to rampant discrimination in the hiring space and it is therefore necessary that government should intervene to resolve the anomaly. Furthermore, this could create a distinction between the labor force themselves where labor performed on site such as in the case of agriculture or construction might be seen as morally inferior in comparison to its work from home counterpart. At the minimum, we would therefore require active revision of our work from home policies by the employers. But at the same time, diversity in the market necessitates that intervention through government policies remain minimal to ensure optimal results. Several countries have begun legislating on this in various aspects. Chile, for example, has enacted a law which mandates that the cost of operation functioning, maintenance and repair of equipment shall vest on the employer. Similar laws or policies have been passed in countries like Colombia and Denmark. Other countries like Greece and Argentina have taken measures to restrict working hours and have introduced the, I quote, right to disconnect. Nevertheless, at the macro level, I must accept the possible potentiality of such virtual working spaces for our cities in the long run. By de-emphasizing the importance of physically located workplaces, cities have a remarkable opportunity to promote a more local lifestyle. 
by discouraging commute which takes long hours the pandemic induced work from home culture holds the potential to promote smaller local markets that address the limited needs of an area's proximate community suppose through technological innovation such an automated cars and through reenactment of municipal policies we can maintain the level of urban efficiency and reduce the need for physical contact in that case the quality of life in cities and the resultant environmental benefits would be immense i now advert to the concept of public employment until now my observations were about the future of labor force in general but i would now like to shift the attention on future of public services which remain the most coveted positions across our country after all how often do we come across newspaper articles reporting that doctoral degree holders have applied for group d posts in response to a recruitment advertisement such a situation would definitely be rare if not impossible when we consider any other nation this fact alone establishes the supremacy of government jobs while opponents to this viewpoint might say that over the last decade government jobs have lost their shine and are mere an avenue for non pecuniary benefits but i would whole heartedly maintain that there is still a long path ahead before it gets displaced from the podium of an average indian's aspiration however the present state of affairs is a bit worrisome why first is the issue of vacancies which as per the latest data are reported to have crossed the mark of more than 60 lakhs with about 10 lakhs vacancies at the central government level only in a welfare state like us the importance of civil servants and government staff is unparalleled because they are the medium through which crucial welfare policies are implemented public goods are allocated and transferred to people the understaffing of public offices therefore negatively impacts the delivery mechanism by overburdening the system secondly is the issue of trend of contractual appointments in government services which are often poorly negotiated the facts and figure indicate that in 2014 43% of government employees were reported to be on temporary or contractual jobs while in 2018 this percentage increased to 59% for central public sector enterprises the share of contractual employees increased from 19% to 37% during the same period furthermore this culture of contractual engagement has led to a practice of hire and fire which may have adverse impact on efficiency of public services and lack of accountability finally something which the judicial system is also being criticized and i'm saying so finally the court's role in the above mentioned scenario too has not been commented well we are blamed of course most often by lay persons for not exercising our powers to direct the vacancies to be filled people expect that we should issue time bound directions to all and everyone pso uh, psus the government sectors that fill up the vacancies in a time bound manner this is what the people legitimate expectation they have from judiciary the other issue is judiciary is often criticized also for intervening in the recruitment process resulting in delays in appointments and promotions this leads to further criticism that courts intervene in policy matters or that the theory of separation of powers as enshrined in our constitutional structure is overlooked but i feel that a court would intervene on such issues only with an intent to nudge the executive by and large our courts have strictly observed the lakshman rekha of separation of powers in this regard of course while ensuring the fundamental rights guaranteed under article 14 and 16 of our constitution are duly protected nevertheless public service is a matter of policy in terms of the current existing vacancies and the limited resources at the disposal of the state to conduct fresh recruitment there must be an increased focus on sectors that create job opportunities 
selective reforms for PSUs, public sector undertakings, that have been performing brilliantly must be prioritized. Sectors which lead to the creation of social, societal assets such as public health or arenas of the future such as green technology including renewable energy and the adoption of electric vehicles are additional avenues which can be accorded a private a priority status. It must be recognized that technologies have huge untapped potential to transform public services which is nowadays often characterized by a workforce lacking capabilities because of the outdated mode of functioning it follows. The pandemic gave a push to a rapid shift to digitization and we all witnessed the benefits as well as the difficulties involved. Of course, with the return of normalcy, it might be apprehended that the world of public service would change back to the earlier modicum. But speaking from my personal experience, I don't foresee such a situation. The changes brought by the pandemic, though out of necessity, are here to stay. In fact, this is an appropriate time to think about access to skill development for this sector also, because any delay would invariably result in a situation where government will lack the desired skill set amongst its employees. Ultimately, this would be a waste of crucial opportunity for harnessing novel public goods, delivery mechanism, and a mismanagement of taxpayers' resources. Present-day governments across the political spectrum have now started tinkering with the established permanency practice. Lateral entries in the government at the secretarial level or short stints at entry level, such as in the army, are good examples of the new age public service model. Fixed term contractual stints with the government like fellowship with the ministers or the position of like law clerks in judicial offices provide invaluable experience without any danger of exploitation. However, such modes of recruitment must assimilate the principles of affirmative action in line with the vision of social justice as enshrined in our constitution. This is the key because otherwise these mechanisms could be employed to skirt provisions for reservations. Coming to the conclusion part, I must say undoubtedly the future, though exciting, is far from ideal. We as a nation stand at the cusp of economic revolution but face challenges that have not been witnessed before and require that society become more proactive in demanding reforms. We all need to collectively adopt the vision of Justice V.R. Krishna when in Gujarat Steel Tube's case he approvingly cited Mahatma Gandhi's work which stated that employers and employees should be accorded the status of equal partners. This would require us to envisage the power relations between them on par with which is indeed a difficult task but a reality when we consider that the powerhouses of this nation are still the micro, small and medium enterprises. While at the stroke of the midnight hour, every Western political commentator were spectacle of our nation's capability to maintain its democracy and democratic credentials. We have proudly proved them wrong when we celebrated our 75th independence anniversary. Sure enough, we have seen our ups and downs as a nation in respect of facing wars, internal strife, environmental disasters, and acute financial pressure during the interregnum. But we have also won many battles together. In a post-pandemic world, we are definitely touted as one of the most robust economy going forward. However, the world of work is changing fast. Structural transformation driven by technology and automation is generating new forms of employment. Different skill sets and higher qualifications are needed to compete in a keenly contested global labor market. Challenges posed by this new economic paradigm should be addressed by preparedness by emerging economies worldwide, including India, 
which has a high age appropriate population ready to join the workforce urgent labor reforms and their proper implementation is the need of the hour and it should be supported by innovative financial sources the age of permanency and security of public employment is at its end the future would invite more individuals who are flexible in their approach and looking to make an immediate social impact as a reputed growth economist and nobel laureate do professor benerji and professor dalfo notes that it is always a quandrum to identify key indicators for inclusive growth and what really matters is that economies avoid mislocation of resources this essentially relates to a problem where economy does not put the resources to their best use i agree to the extent that the future of work problem is one that requires us to put our resources to their best use the best bet therefore is what is to attempt to raise living standards with the resources we already have investing in the education especially skill development and health improving the functioning of public offices and building more livable cities in the absence of any magic potion for solving our problems as in a virtual game the best way to profoundly transform is not to try to invest in vain but to focus squarely on the thing policy makers are supposed to improve namely the well-being of the poor thank you very much thank you for very much for giving me this opportunity i am grateful to the trust to inviting me jai hind jai bharat thank you lordship thank you for those words of wisdom now may I request justice k balakrishnan nayar president sharada krishna satgamaya foundation to present a memento to our chief justice honorable mr justice s manikumar as a token of our profound appreciation we are moving on to the award presentation ceremony may I request our chief justice honorable mr justice s manikumar to do the honors we'll be distributing the merit awards for llm starting with anuja rajam cheriyan central university of kerala Next in line is Arjun Philip George from Central University of Kerala. Anuja Rajam Cheriyan is on stage. Arjun Philip George, Central University of Kerala. Badal Chatterjee. from central university of kerala is up next sriraj mohan from kannur university sriraj mohan kannur university Sri Rak Mohan from Kannur University receiving the merit award. Next up is Sri Jha K Menon from Kannur University. Sri Jha K Menon. After Sri Jha K Menon, Ahmad Rifai K will be receiving the award. Sri Jha K Menon on stage. Ahmad Rifai K M from Kannur University. Next up is Nandana N P from Kannur University. Nandana N P. Ah.
after nandana shajit m from kerala university of fisheries and ocean studies will be receiving the award nandana np from kannur university receiving the award we have on stage shajit m from kerala university of fisheries and ocean studies receiving the merit award next up is hilma joseph from calicut university in her absence her sister grishma joseph will be receiving the award for and on her behalf Anisha Dominic from Calicut University Anisha Dominic Praveena C from Calicut University kindly come on to the stage and receive your award Praveena C Next up is Jinsu Raichu Sajan from Cochin University of Science and Technology. May I request all the awardees for their LLM batch to kindly come and stand on the right side of the auditorium. Jinsu Raichu Sajan from Cochin University of Science and Technology. Up next is Karun Sanjaya from Cochin University of Science and Technology. Karun Sanjaya. followed by linta and john also from cochin university of science and technology karun sanjaya on dais linta and john from cochin university of science and technology shruti jayakumar cochin university of science and technology in her absence her father mr jayakumar will be receiving the award for and on her behalf Mr Jayakumar on behalf of Shruti Jayakumar Aditya Tejas Krishnan from University of Kerala Aditya Tejas Krishnan on dais Next up is Zora Susan Abraham from University of Kerala Zora Susan Abraham Zora Susan Abraham on dais Up next is Fatima Ibrahim from University of Kerala Fatima Ibrahim Ashwati Sugumaran Ettungapadi from University of Kerala will be receiving the award next Ashwati Sugumaran Next up is Prajida S Salim from University of Kerala. Prajida S Salim University of Kerala. Followed by Albin Anto from National University of Advanced Legal Studies. Albin Anto. Albin Anto will also be receiving the award for rank in LLB BBA LLB from Mahatma Gandhi University Albin Anto Abhirami Tirumeni T from Mahatma Gandhi University will be receiving the merit award for rank in BBA LLB Abhirami Tirumeni T Now may I request all the award holders from different universities for LLB to kindly come and stand on the right side of the auditorium LLB merit award is Next up is Lakshmiya TM from Mahatma Gandhi University for BBA LLB Lakshmiya TM
Maria Josephine from Mahatma Gandhi University. Maria Josephine. Gayatri Ji from Mahatma Gandhi University on day on the stage to receive her award. Gayatri Ji. Next up is Ananda Shankar Karta from Mahatma Gandhi University for BBA LLB course. Ananda Shankar Karta. Next up is Sharanya T. Naya from Mahatma Gandhi University, rank holder in LLB. Next up is Akhila E. from Mahatma Gandhi University for BA LLB course. Akhila E. Akhila E. Kindly come on to the dais. Next up is Amrita K. P. from Mahatma Gandhi University. Amrita K. P. from Mahatma Gandhi University for BA LLB course. Next up is Anamika Krishnan from Mahatma Gandhi University for BA LLB. In her absence, her father, Mr. C. Krishnan, will be receiving the award. For and on behalf of Anamika Krishnan. Next up is Grishma Dev from Mahatma Gandhi University for BCOM LLB. Grishma Dev, Mahatma Gandhi University. Steffi George from Mahatma Gandhi University for BCOM LLB. Followed by K.M. Devika from Mahatma Gandhi University for BCOM LLB. K.M. Devika. Next up is Basima UK from Mahatma Gandhi University for BCOM LLB. We have another awardee from LLM category. Next up is Vijo TV from Mahatma Gandhi University. May I request Vijo TV to come on to the dais and receive his award? Lulu Mary Vargas from Mahatma Gandhi University, rank holder in LLB. Lulu Mary Vargas on stage. Next up is Pournami PK from Mahatma Gandhi University, rank holder in LLB. Pournami PK. Next up is Suni Thomas from Mahatma Gandhi University, rank holder in LLB. Suni Thomas on stage. Sure. Yes. Suni Thomas is the wife of Honorable Mr. Justice Viju Abraham. Next up is Mahija Madhu from Kannur University for BA LLB course. Mahija Madhu on stage. Next up is Anjana PK from Kannur University for BA LLB course. Anjana PK. Followed by Ananya M from Kannur University. For BA LLB course. 
Ananya M from Kanur University on dais. Next is Rekshmi Murali Dharan from University of Calicut for BBA LLB course. Rashmi Murali Dharan on stage. Shaila Farsana from University of Calicut for BBA LLB course. Shaila Farsana. Next step is Vini Mutkal Jos from University of Calicut for LLB course. Vini Mutkal Jos. Next step is Disa K. Kumar from University of Calicut. Disa K. Kumar. Next up is Sruti Jay Kumar from Cochin University of Science and Technology. In her absence, may I request her father, Mr. Jay Kumar, to receive the award on her behalf. Mr. Jay Kumar is receiving the second award on behalf of Sruti Jay Kumar. Next up is Pooja Pradeep from Cochin University of Science and Technology. Award winner for BCOM LLB. Next up is Aparna Subramanian from Cochin University of Science and Technology. Award holder in BBA LLB. Next, we have Bhagya Lakshmi VL from Cochin University of Science and Technology. Award holder in BCOM LLB course. Bhagya Lakshmi VL on stage. Kunya Lakshmi J from Cochin University of Science and Technology. Award holder in BBA LLB. Next up is Helen Mary Vargas from Cochin University of Science and Technology for BCOM LLB. Helen Mary Vargas. Next up is Sukanya C. Prasannan from University of Kerala for LLB batch. Sukanya C. Prasannan. Next up is Parvati M from University of Kerala for BA LLB course. Parvati M. Next up is Sandra Susan Binu from University of Kerala for BCOM LLB. In her absence, her father, Mr. Binu Thomas, will be receiving the award for and on behalf of Sandra Susan Binu. Next up is Uma Devi S. from University of Kerala, rank holder in BBA LLB. Uma Devi S. on stage. Next we have K. Kavya Mohan from University of Kerala, rank holder in LLB batch. K. Kavya Mohan. Next up is Anjali Devi P from University of Kerala for BA LLB. In her absence, her mother, Advocate Usha Kumari, will be receiving the award. Next is Annie Susan Vargas. Award holder from University of Kerala for BCOM LLB. In her absence, her brother Georgie will be receiving the award. 
for and on behalf of Annie Susan Vargas. Next up is Kavita K from University of Kerala for BBA LLB course. Kavita K. Next up is Sri Yukta S from University of Kerala for BA LLB course. Sri Yukta S on stage. Next up is Krishna Priya from University of Kerala for BCom LLB. Krishna Priya from University of Kerala. I invite Georgia Maria George from University of Kerala, award winner in BBA LLB course. Georgia Maria George. Next up is Ashna D from National University of Advanced Legal Studies for BA LLB course. In her absence, her mother, Dr. Usha Pai, is receiving the award for and on behalf of Ashna D. Next up is Vini Degavane from National University of Advanced Legal Studies for BA LLB course. Vini Degavane. Next up is Dilmrik Nayani from National University of Advanced Legal Studies, award winner in BA LLB course. They both have not reported yet. We have come to the end of award distribution ceremony. On behalf of one and all, I thank our Honorable Chief Justice for doing the honors. Hearty congratulations to all the award winners. I invite Advocate Sanand Ramakrishnan, Secretary Sharada Krishna Sadgamaya Foundation to propose the vote of thanks. Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Kant, Judge Supreme Court of India. Honorable Mr. Justice S. Mani Kumar, Honorable Chief Justice of Kerala. Justice K. Balakrishnan Nair, President of the Sarada Krishna Sadgamaya Foundation. Our Chief Patron, uh, Justice Ramakrishnan. Honorable Judges of the High Court, both past and present. Senior advocates, advocates, students who have assembled here from all over Kerala, and other well wishers of Justice Krishnaya. Ladies and gentlemen, in this August gathering, I, it fills me with happiness that the eighth Justice B.R. Krishnaya Memorial Lecture has been delivered with masterful eloquence by Justice Surya Kant, Judge Supreme Court of India. In fact, the topic was chosen by your lordships, and it is indeed a topic of uh, immense relevance uh, in the post-pandemic uh, scenario. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Foundation and in my personal capacity, I express my heartfelt gratitude to Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Kant for taking time out of his uh, otherwise packed schedule. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Honorable Mr. Justice S. Mani Kumar, Chief Justice of Kerala, very readily agreed to preside over the function and wholeheartedly extended all support in the conduct of this function. I'm sure the students who have gathered here would cherish having received their awards from none other than the Chief Justice of Kerala, who is the pater familias of the high courts in Kerala. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and my personal capacity, I express my sincere and heartfelt gratitude to Honorable Mr. Justice S. Mani Kumar for presiding over the function and giving away the merit awards to the students. It would not have been possible to hold the function with, without your kind support. Thank you very much, sir. I also thank all the members of the Board of Trustees of the Sharda Krishna Sadgamaya Foundation for Law and Justice, especially its President, K. Balakrishnan Nair, Vice Presidents, uh, P. B. Sahasranaman, sir, and uh, V. V. Siddharthan, sir, senior advocates. Uh, Advocate Lakshmi Narayan, Dr. K.P. Pradeep, and Nikhil Shankar, 
and uh, Srimati Chandrika Arvindakshan for their magnanimous and wholehearted efforts. A word of uh, gratitude is also due to Sri P. Krishna Kumar, Honorable Registrar General of the High Court, Sri T. S. Arun, Public Relations Officer, and Sri Robin of the IT Section of the High Court, without whose wholehearted cooperation this function could not have been organized. I offer my vote of thanks today to all of you, not merely as a formality, but also with absolute humility in your esteemed presence. I offer this thanks as a Guru Dakshina to my father's Guru, just as we are Krishnaya. Thank you. May I request all the award winners uh, from the LLM batch to kindly come on to the dais so that a group photo can be taken with our Chief Justice, our Honorable Chief Justice, Honorable Mr. Justice Manikumar. This will be followed by a group photo session for the LLB awardees also. I request you all to be ready. Uh, 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 Honorable Justice, Mr. Surya Khan, my lords, uh, uh, this is a group photo being taken. Therefore, if your lordships is otherwise uh, occupied, your lordships may log off. Thank you, thank you. Uh, may I request all the award winners from the LLM batch to kindly come on to the dais. First, we'll be taking a picture with the winners, award winners from the LLM batch, followed by another group photo with award winners of the LLB batch. Can we have a big round of applause for all the award winners from the LLM batch? who is presently on stage. Thank you everyone. Next up is the award winners from the LLB batch from various universities in state of Kerala. May I also request the presence of Honorable Mr. Justice Biju Abraham on the dais for this occasion. If your lordships could kindly join the award winners on the dais. May I also request Honorable Mr. Justice Shaji P. Chali to come on to the dais.
we have the award winners from the llb batch from various universities in the state of kerala thank you everyone we have come to the end of the ceremony kindly raise for the national anthem जनगण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जलधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय हे स्मॉल अनाउंसमेंट वी आर गिविंग पार्टिसिपेशन सर्टिफिकेट टू ऑल दू दो grace this occasion with their presence so i request you all to collect your participation certificate from the right side of the auditorium where you have registered everybody who participated in the ceremony will be getting a participation certificate thank you